So I will start with a brief additional introduction about myself. My name is Alessandro Benedetti. Uh, I was born in Tarquinia, a 3,000 years old city, a Tuscan city in Italy. And I am an R&D software engineer and director at CIS. I have a master's degree in computer science from the University of Rome. And I am program committee member of the uh, ECIR conference, the European Conference on Information Retrieval, the special interest group in Information Retrieval Conference, and the SIES. I'm a Lucina Solar uh, committer and Solar PMC member. And I've been also working for uh, many years with Elasticsearch and OpenSearch. I am quite passionate about information retrieval and how you can integrate information retrieval with artificial intelligence techniques and machine learning. And in my spare time, I love playing beach volleyball and snowboarding. Not in London, where I mostly live for the greatest part of the year, but when I go back to Italy for summer or <laughs> winter. Uh, Director of SIS, this is uh, my company funded in 2016. We are headquartered in London and we are open source enthusiasts. So we dedicate a lot of our energy to open source software and information retrieval related open source software. So we contribute a lot to Lucene and Solar mostly. And we also work with Elasticsearch and OpenSearch as technologies. And we are community contributors and supporters. So we, are, we contribute back code, but also support support in the mailing list and in Slack channels and etc. And we are active researchers, so we are on the cutting edge of the information retrieval development, always trying to bring new ideas to uh, Lucene and Solar and to our clients, of course. And our hot trends at the moment, neural search integrations, natural language processing, integrating with Lucene and Solar, leading to rank document similarity, so effectively they're more like this functionality in the search engines. Search quality evaluation, so we are strong advocate of measuring your search, and we contribute the rated rank evaluator, which is an open source software for doing that. And in general, we've been working a lot on relevant tuning. So today we are going to start introducing the reasons, the motivations behind the multi-valued fields for vectors, and what's the impact on the algorithm currently used in Apache Lucene, which is HNSW, which stands for Hierarchical Navigable Small World Graph. Then we are going to detail the changes required at indexing time internals in Lucene and query time internals. So what's necessary to be changed to support at query time multiple valued in a vector field. And finally, I'm going to wrap it up and talk also about the challenges of the contribution. So let's start from the motivation. So why multi-valued for vector fields can be useful? And we will start what, with what you can do right now. So what's possible currently in Lucene and the technologies that adopt Lucene? When you have a text content that exceeds the length supported by an inference model of your preference. So normally, what you do, you take text in input, you push your text to an inference model that returns you vectors, and these models support up to a certain number of tokens. So it's a certain number of ter terms, effectively. So um, at the moment, what can you do? You can split the content in paragraphs, passages, and, and effectively split them in different documents. At that point, your unit of information will change. So it's not a document anymore you are working with and returning to your users, but it's uh, a passage or a paragraph. And these are, these are some uh, implications that we will see in the next slide. And when returning results, of course, you need to aggregate back to documents. So that's something necessary if you, if you want currently to split your content, your, length, your long content, and then collapse it again to document level. So what are the considerations for these three points right now? Splitting the content in paragraphs across your, your multiple documents. So it means that at indexing time, you may approach the problem with nested documents in Lucene. And this means effectively having parent documents and children for each of the parent. And the children will be the paragraphs. Uh, it's mostly slow and potentially expensive from the computational side of things. So 
It's not ideal, possible in some scenarios, but it's not the, the best in the class. Another approach could be to flatten the, the documents and effectively bringing redundant information in, in your corpus. It's possible, again, but there are negative sides of it. Also, the second point, so your unit of information moves from documents to paragraphs. So for some use cases, this won't be a problem, but if you're running aggregations, faceting, statistics on your result set, that clearly requires some additional computation on top of them to bring the counts back to the granularity you wanted, so like document granularity. And especially, this means that you will need to collapse again, like the count coming from faceting, for example, from passage level to document level. So additional work, additional problems and time necessary and resources. And finally, when you return the documents, so the top K to your users, you need to aggregate again your paragraphs, your passages to documents. And this means potentially using parent-child joint queries in Lucene. So if you use an indexing time, a nested document approach, such as the block join, for example, if you are a little bit familiar with nested document in Lucene, you may recognize the, the terms. You may go with a parent-child join query at query time. But also in this case, it's generally slow and expensive. Of, of course, it may be OK for your use case, but if you have a lot of data, potentially it's not good enough for you. Or you may use, if you approached, was, if you approached the problem with flattened documents at indexing time, you may use like collapsing or grouping functionalities to bring them back to the document level. And also in this case, it means additional calculi and, and more work to be done at query time. So these considerations actually are not only relevant for uh, vector-based search. So uh, multi-valued fields have been in, in Lucene for many field types for a very long time. So it's, it's actually not an, a new thing. It's just the fact that at the moment, it's not available for vector-based fields used for KNN search mostly, so K nearest neighbor search. And as I said, you may be OK using those strategies I mentioned. So it's fine. I mean, maybe for some of you, maybe some of you are already using these strategies to, to model like multi-valued vectors. For some other users, it may be quite annoying and time-consuming, expensive. So that's the, the main motivation behind having multi-valued also for vector fields. And what does it mean to bring multi-valued for vector KNN fields in Apache Lucene. Potentially, we may need to change the K nearest neighbor algorithm in some way to support multivalues. Maybe we need to change or add some additional data structures at indexing time. And maybe we need to revisit the approach. And the same at query time. So potentially, we may need changes in the data structures and in the approach. So let's start from the K and N implementation that's in Lucene. So we have both exact nearest neighbor and approximate nearest neighbor. Exact nearest neighbor means you take an input a query vector and you calculate the distance between the query vector and each of the vectors in your corpus of information. And that's expensive. Approximate nearest neighbor means you are OK to lose a little bit of accuracy if you gain a massive performance advantage. And this means normally to pre-process your vector data and model them in some sort of collapsed data structure, which is normally tree-based, hash-based, or graph-based. And specifically in Lucene, a graph-based approach called HNSW is the one that's, that's used. And we are going to actually explain a little bit better how it works. So H HNSW stands for Hierarchical Navigable Small World Graphs. And it's actually one of the top performing solutions for approximate nearest neighbor currently available. And 
I leave in here a couple of papers that explain the full details, but I want you to have a high, a high level understanding on, on how it works. So HNSW, how it works in a nutshell. So first of all, the graph we are mentioning here are proximity graphs. So graphs that model the distance between vectors. And for distance, I'm talking about a poten and there are different ways, different metrics for calculating a distance between vectors. So that's one of the parameters actually supported by Lucene to, to decide how you calculate this distance. But you can imagine as a metric that represents how far and actually how similar two vectors are from each other. And the vertices in the graph are vectors. And vectors that are close in distance, so they have high similarity, are linked together. So those are the links in the graph. And the reason it's called hierarchical is because we have graphs on different layers. So effectively, we have multiple graphs. And we will have a top layer that presents uh, a small quantity of nodes, so a small percentage of the nodes with a small percentage of links. And this is for effectively having like fast retrieval. And then you descend into the layers to get more accuracy. So the more we go down in layers, the more nodes and links we model. And that's actually like an approach that is stolen from like a skip list. And we will see the, the comparison as well. So each layer is a graph, so it's a full graph, and we can look for neighbors to an input vector. And depending on how connected is this, this, this graph, and especially how many, effectively the degree of the connection for each of the node will impact if you find the, the global minimum in one of the layer, or if you need to descend to the, uh, the zero level, which basically will contain all the nodes and the connections that you build at index in time. Of course, higher the degree, higher the average degree of your nodes, the more expensive it is to build the graph and to explore the graph at query time, uh, but the more, the more accuracy as well. So it's, it's basically an approach, as I said, coming from skip list when you are looking for a specific element in a list of order elements, and in the top layer, you have a small percentage of all the elements in the array, and you quickly identify a point where you descend and you get more nodes, and you can effectively navigate up to the, the, the node or the closest neighbor to the node you are looking for. And the reason skip lists were quite successful is because they are quite fast to, for insertion and retrieval. And we wanted, I mean, when the, the researchers were studying approximate nearest neighbor approaches, they wanted to have fast insertion and fast retrieval. So each graph, each small world, effectively, offers you the possibility of looking for neighbors to a query vector. So you start from an entry point, potentially a random entry point in, in the first layer you encounter. And then you calculate the distances between the query vector and the neighbors. You start from a graph that is less connected and with less nodes. So it's actually fast to navigate. And then you identify the closest neighbor in the graph and then you descend in the other layers. So effectively, you will go down and use as an entry point what you found in the, in the upper layer. So at indexing time, what happens and how this algorithm may change if we have multiple values. So when you, when you are building the graph at indexing time, you add a vector at the time. The vector will have a certain probability of entering the layer n, of course, the more we go down in layers, higher the probability. And if we reach the zero layer, which is the last layer, we will have a probability of one to add 
the, the node. And effectively, whenever you add a node to a layer, it will go down to all the other layers. So first of all, we need to identify the layer of insertion. So we scan the different layers. We calculate the probability. And whenever it's one, we know that we want to add the vector in, in that layer. So exploring the different layers, we start from the top. We look for the top k1 most similar vector to the input one we want to insert. And then we descend using that as an entry point. So basically, we are descending the layers, identifying at each step the closest neighbor, so the closest to our vector we want to insert. When we reach the layer of insertion, we are going to, to look for top k candidates to connect to our inserted value. And there is one parameter, which is in Lucene and then in all the search engine that uh, make this feature surface to servers such as Solar, Elasticsearch, and OpenSearch. We have a parameter called EF construction that effectively dictate how many candidates we are going to look for for building the connections. So we identify this set of candidates. And among these candidates, we are going to take just the m, an additional parameter. And only the m closer vectors are going to be connected, the one we are inserting. And will this change for multiple values? So uh, this part of the algorithm actually doesn't know if a node is related to only one document. So each node in our case is not a document, it's a vector. And it has a vector ID, an ordinal representing the vector. And we won't change the way we add elements in the, in the graph, but we know that we'll have multiple vectors per document ID. And at query time, what happens effectively that we are again starting from the top layer where we, are, we have less nodes, so it's faster to explore it. We identify the entry point, we descend, run again like a search in there, descend, descend till the last level, where we do again a full top K retrieval to look for the closest elements. And with the multi-valued scenario, and when we are looking for vectors, effectively it won't change. We're looking for the top K vectors originally, but then we want to return to the user documents. So if we are adding to our top K, to the result list, two vectors coming from the same document, we need to aggregate the score in some way. So we, we need to, effectively, we'll have two distances, two similarities. And we want just one score for the documents to return. So at this point, we will have uh, a change in, uh, in the algorithm. So in this example, you see a top K list uh, and written. So I beg your pardon if it's not artistically nice, but I'm an engineer, so it's not my specialty to, to paint and sketch things. So I have a, we have a ranking list on the left, uh, starting from the uh, best document so far, with a score of 0 0.9, document 7, then document 3, 9, 1, 5, 2. Each of them has a similarity score. And what happens if we find in the graph a new vector that belongs to one of the documents that are already in the top K. So uh, I wanted to keep it simple, so I designed two approaches, a max approach or a sum approach. So for the max approach, whenever a new vector arrives with a new score, I keep the max of the similarities. So for document three, a new vector is coming with a similarity of 0 0.85, in regards to the query vector. The original score was 0 0.8, so we keep the max. So the new score for document three is going to be 0 0.85. And the same happened in the example for document one. We get a new vector with an ID vector 100 with a score of 0 0.77, which is higher than 0 0.6, we keep the max. And this brings a change in the ranking this time. So for document three, it didn't change the ranking. For document one, we are actually going to change the ranking. So it's going up, and document nine is going down. With the sum approach, it's not much different, actually. So the, the difference is that we update the score, summing the original score of the document so far with the new vector score. And in this case, the ranking will change 
uh, in comparison to the max example. And actually, with this approach, the score is not probabilistic anymore. So it's not comp between 0 and 1 anymore, which is the current similarity boundaries for, for documents. Still, can be useful in some scenarios. And we are not actually summing all the vectors for a document distances, but only the one we encounter in the graph. So exploring the graph, we are already, already getting uh, only the closer vectors. So effectively, we will just update the final score of the document with some of the best candidates for the vectors within that field. So let's move to Lucene and Let's have like an overview of what's currently in place with Lucene vector-based search and the changes that uh, I made in, in this contribution. Uh, with Lucene 9.0, we got a dedicated set of data structures to model vector-based search and using the HNSW algorithm. And over the, the months in 2021 and 2022 and 23, we had a lot of progress in there. So we got uh, support for the hierarchical side of this algorithm because originally it was just one layer supported. It, there was the addition of pre-filtering and the possibility of only considering live documents and, and on and on, like eight bits uh, quantization for vectors. So instead of having vectors only uh, float values of supported for vectors. Uh, at a certain point, we were like, OK, maybe it's going to be beneficial if we, if we support also just uh, byte values. So um, we'll, if in certain scenarios, your values range from minus 128 to 127. Maybe you don't need float. So you, you may use less memory, and will be faster, and you will be happier. And I leave in here in the slides that will be available offline also the Jira issues, back in the days that Jira was used, and the GitHub issues linked to vector-based search. I try to tag them uh, as much as I can, also Jiras that I don't work with. So it's, it may be not fully up-to-date, because not everyone uh, keeps the tags updated, the label updated on GitHub, but it's decently updated. So this talk is going to be about a pull request that is currently open to the public, so it's available, you can take a look. It's under review, we are working with other committers to finalize it, and let's see the changes in Lucene. The first aspect that uh, we needed to address is indexing time and the auxiliary data structures necessary to model multiple vectors per document. So the, the most important thing is to map a vector ID to a document ID. So that's the main thing. And in a multi-value scenario, we may have multiple vectors belonging to the same document ID. Now, this is already supported in Lucene for sparse representation of vector field data. So currently, you may have documents then that don't have a vector for a field. So that's a, a scenario that is supported by Lucene. So right now, you may have a maximum one value for a vector field, but a minimum of zero values. So the necessity of mapping an ordinal vector ID to a document ID is already there. Because potentially, you may have missing documents, so the vector ID won't match with the document ID, because there is a gap. And effectively, this is currently implemented using a data structure that keeps track of the uh, absent, uh, absent fields for, for documents, um, which I rewrote with the docs with vector set implementation and the direct monotonic writer to write in the index the map between the ordinal vector ID and the document ID. And this happens in the Lucene 95 HNSW vectors writer. So what does the docs with vector set uh, do for, for this problem? So it's an accumulator of documents that have vectors. So when the uh, HNSW vectors writer is writing data, you want, to know, you want to know how many vectors per document, because then you want to use the uh, monotonic writer to, to write the correct amount of vectors 
for, for a document and keep track of the gaps potentially between a vector ID and the document ID. So whenever we add a document, we keep a counter, we update it, and then we push the value as soon as we get a new document ID different from the previous one, we push the value of the counter to a stack and we keep track of how many vectors for each document. And then effectively, we, we end up with a map that associates a number of vectors for each document to, to make it simple. And this happens in the docs with vector set class. And so what's a direct monotonic writer? So effectively, it's just a component that writes a sequence of numbers, and specifically a sequence of integers, monotonically increasing. So monotonically increasing means that they may stay constant or increase, but never decrease. And the monotonic writer writes this in blocks for like uh, an optimal management of, of, of memory. And in our case, so for building an ordinal map from a vector ID to a document ID, each integer is a document ID. And the same document ID is repeated for the number of times it, the document has vectors. And this is possible because it's monotonic. So you can have multiple document IDs, the same document IDs, constant, and then and when you change the document ID, you have an increase. And this is currently used in the sparse of heap vector values implementation, as I said, because we already have scenarios where it doesn't match one-to-one -one in ordinal to the document ID. And there is a specific method, which is ord to doc, which takes in input the ordinal, so the vector ID, and returns you the document ID. And internally, is going to use this index to access a specific block, and then within the block, access the position for the document ID for that vector. So it was not super easy, but at least it was possible to reuse some data structure that was already there, and index in time, so nice. And node ID is, in our case, in building our HNSW graph, is the vector ID. So uh, like in this sparse scenario, each node in the graph has an incremental ID, which is the uh, vector ID. So effectively, for building the node, uh, the graph, I didn't have to change anything particularly. So there was no code change, some very minimal change, but nothing relevant. Now, let's see at query time. So at query time, we have a vector scorer, and that's used in exact search. So we have two, two different scenarios, so exact search and approximate search. So for exact search, uh, which is effectively like not the majority of, of use cases in Lucene, uh, I, I went with a naive solution that of course can improve. I mean, nothing in this pull request is final, right? So actually, at the end, I will ask for potential help in reviewing and improving the solution. So it's, it's not anything like sculpted in hard rock. Uh, but the current naive solution is effectively using the vector scorer. There are two implementations you'll see, one for float vectors, one for byte vectors. And you scan all the vectors. You take only the one that are accepted by the filter or your live documents. And you then update the score with a maximum approach or a sum approach. So you are literally iterating on all the vectors and only calculate the distance for the one accepted by the bit set in input. And this happened in the abstract KNN vector query. But let's talk about the approximate search, which is actually the most important. So HNSW search, uh, which searches on vectors, graph nodes, and returning documents. So that's actually the, the main part we want to change. So when you search on a level that is different from the last level, vectors are added as candidates, as results, because you want to use those vectors as entry point. And when you search on level zero, you want document IDs in the results. So you want to map from the ordinal again to the doc. And you want to add the results in a neighbor queue 
which is a data structure that is used in, in the HNSW graph searcher. So the neighbor queue is an important data structure that needed to, to change because it's when effectively you are building the top K and updating potentially the scores. So currently, the neighbor queue is modeled as a data structure to collect top K results, and specifically for the results is a minimum IP. So we keep the top of the queue as the minimum, effectively, and potentially you, you're going to change that if a, a new node has a higher score and that minimum is going to go uh, off the, the queue. And each element is a long, and the first mo most significant bits of the long is the score, and then the less significant 32 bits of the long is the complement of the document ID. It's the complement of the document ID, because if we have a tie, we want a document with an ID, a small ID, to win over a document with a with a big ID. This is consistent with Lucene approach in, in managing ties. So we have the, this neighbor queue. Each element effectively will have the score and, and the ID encoded. And when we update a, the score of the document, we need a cache that tells us like the document ID where is in the heap. So you, you use this small cache that anyway will have a length of top K elements, you get the ID in the heap, you change the score in the heap, and then you do a down heap operation because your score is increased potentially. And not, not never decreasing, it's max or sum, so you go down the heap effectively, so closer to the top. So what the, the main challenges for this is that to build the first prototype, it took a one year because it was a side project. So we, we had a lot of things to do in my company, and I was using some of my time for this contribution, but it took a long time. And given it was a super active area, a lot of time has been spent in merges, effectively. So I had most of my time, actually, were merges. And this has to do also with the Lucene Codex that changed name with a different release. And sometimes uh, Git has a certain level of tolerance to understanding when like, you change the same file or if it's a new file. So uh, a lot of also manual merges had to, to happen to keep the changes in some mm, class that, that basically changed over the, the releases. And I ended up with 85 classes as a diff, which is almost impossible to review. So I was like, OK, step down. Let's simplify a little bit the contribution. Let's remove the strategy max and sum. Start, let's start with a max approach and keep, of course, like as the next contribution, the, I will bring back the code for max and sum. Uh, I've been simplifying thanks to some review comments, some of the aspects for configuration, and, and everything went down to 25 classes as it is, which is much more manageable. And I would like to thank actually uh, Benjamin Trent, Maya Sharipova, Jim Ferenzi, and Josh Devins for the first reviews and, and com comments they gave, which is really helpful. And so to wrap up, we have been talking about the motivations for multivalue, so why we need multivalue fields in vector fields, KNN fields. Uh, what's the impact on the algorithm on HNSW and how it works and how it changes with multiple values? What's the changes in Lucene at indexing time and the changes in Lucene at query time? And what were the challenges for this contribution? So I'll leave you the link for uh, the pull request and you can help. So how do you want to make it happen? Help us with the code. So of course, it's open source. It's there. You can review uh, the code of the pull request. You can help with improving it uh, or sponsoring us. So if you want us to continue working on that, uh, because we pretty much exhausted the funding to dedicate to this project, uh, keep in touch. Uh, and we can continue working on it. And thank you very much. And I'll leave you the, the QR code for <laughs> my profile. Thank you, Alessandro. Thank you so much. Yes, we already have questions for you. Someone else have asked questions in other sessions. No? Okay. Cool. Thank you for a very nice talk. Um, so, have you experimented with relevance uh, measurements using the sum, the, the max, and 
possibly combinations and whatever? So the short answer is no, because I've been the current implementation effectively is at the stage of a working prototype. So it, the vast amount of work was literally to allow this integration to work. Uh, I've been reading a bit, and apparently max approach is the most standard to do with like multiple values for vector fields. But I would say that benchmarking the solution, so as soon as we move away from the prototype phase to productionize it, first phase will be benchmarking it from a performance perspective and quality perspective. So in a similar case in the pre-vector uh, world, uh, we had hierarchical documents and we found that one approach that worked very nicely was to essentially uh, take the number of sub-documents that matched, let's say, three terms, the number that matched two terms, the number that matched one terms, and then apply a magic formula to them, mm. which is a little bit different from either max or sum. Um, and that, but that seemed to work very well, because that said, oh, I have really strong evidence that you're answering this specific question, but I also have some evidence that you're asking par answering parts of the question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, makes sense. I mean, max and sum were the first ideas, like the simplest as possible. Of course, then we can extend it with any kind of strategy. Hi, thanks, uh, great talk. Um, unfortunately, I had no time to review it now, but Fine. for sure I will do it next week. Uh, one question, because uh, from the history, and I wanted to uh, know if you are reusing that from the history of uh, the first implementation 9.0, the vectors were stored as binary doc values, and a little bit later, 9.1, it was using the sorted doc values, which is conforming to that, and so what you're doing now is you're switching from sorted dog values to sorted set dog values somehow, because it's also using the ordinary numbers and own, and the HNSW graph is not modified at all, I think. Yeah. Exactly. So, that, that so are you reusing that stuff from the dog values, or did you have a completely separate implementation? That's, no. Okay. There's no separate implementation you're reusing internally, uh, but as I mentioned, like, uh, there are aspects that potentially can be like improved using additionally different data structure in Lucene. But yeah, I've not rewritten that, so it's reusing old data structures already in Lucene. Uh, but of course, happy if, if I get more reviews because potentially there are some obscure class, for example, that is a better fit for that. Thank you for a very nice talk. Uh, this might be a bit of a tangential question. Um, when working with uh, heterogeneous sets of documents, like different document lengths, with the different parts of the document being, for instance, paragraphs, as you said, or sentences or whatever, uh, when you aggregate results, you often end up uh, tying document length with relevancy, um, especially when, for instance, summing the cosine similarity of the uh, different parts. I was wondering if, you've, uh, if that's a problem that you uh, have dealt with, and if you have any experiences mm -hmm. to share there. So for the exact search implementation, which as I mentioned was done in a naive form, just to make it work effectively, and then we can iterate and improve it, there's going to be that problem, because it's literally just taking each vector for the document and considering as part of the distance, and if you use the max, okay, yeah, maybe in that case it's just a matter of probability. So of course, the longer, yeah, I mean, the longer it is the document, the higher is the probability you may get like a better max, but it's not a given. With the sum approach, yeah, you will just end up effectively like mm, boosting up long documents. So definitely, in the in the exact search side of things, needs to be changed. Uh, for the approximate side of things. It's slightly different because we are exploring the graph. So we may stop at a certain point collecting only the, the neighbors and we, we stop and we are not necessarily looking for all the, the vectors like for that field. Uh, given that anyway, will be definitely a side of to, to explore more and, and check when to stop, like for example, Instead of summing up to prevent that problem, you could also use the average. If you found three vectors, you uh, then, but, but that's similar to the maximum, I think. I think the problem is exactly the same, like with uh, Dismax or uh, uh, yeah. Boolean query. Yeah, exactly. So the, the idea is like to give support to, to possible ways of 
solving the thing. With Max, probably you are a little bit more covered, but. All right, so that's the time that we have now. Thank you so much, Alessandro, for the presentation and answering the questions. <laughs> <laughs>